And now we have the lecture about the lower water temperature research, FINA, IOC, ITU. As you know, in uh, ITU, since the beginning, we have a rule about uh, the use of bed suite, the lower temperature load. And uh, after the research that uh, we did uh, with Otago University about the upper lower temperature, we decided to study the limit of our, about our rule uh, of the water lower temperature. When uh, we decide uh, this research, uh, unanimously, IOC, ITU, and uh, FINA decide to involve Mike Titan in this uh, research. Uh, Mike Titan is a professor leader of uh, the STREM laboratory in Portsmouth University. He was uh, involved uh, in Royal Air Force, UK Sport. Now he's the senior editor of the journal of STREM Physiology and Medicine, and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine. Ma, first of all, I think that is uh, the most important research in the world about the uh, study of the lower temperature, of the swimming in the lower temperature, and the survival in the sea with more than 450 uh, research published in a scientific paper. Please, Mike, it's a pleasure to have uh, you with us. Thank you. So um, I'm going to use this microphone if I can. Yeah? People hear me? Hello, 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 hello. Oh, wait, yeah, there, yeah, hello. Um, so thank you very much, Sergio, and thank you to uh, the organizers for inviting me to this conference. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a background on cold water immersion and then talk to you about some of the research which Sergio mentioned. Um, so I'm from the uh, Extreme Environments Laboratory uh, at the University of Portsmouth. And we can do strange things there to you. We can make you very cold, we can make you very hot. We can go for swims in cold water on the top of Everest. Not many people do that, but we have that capability. And so um, we undertook this research within that laboratory. And you'll hear me referring to some swims in our flume um, later on. So I just wanted to show you a picture of that. So there are four stages of immersion associated with particular risk and they're listed on this slide. And I just want to give you a bit of a background because that justifies some of the conclusions we've reached um, later on. So the first danger comes from entering the water as the skin is rapidly cooled. And let me show you what happens then. So what you're going to see is um, a video of somebody being submerged into water at 10 degrees Celsius. The number on the right-hand side of the screen is his maximum breath hold time. He's trying to hold his breath as long as he can. He can do it for one minute in air. Um, maximum breath hold time in cold water, wearing heavy clothing, around about five seconds. And we described that response many years ago, and we called it the cold shock response. So that's the first problem that you have. And if you look at people trying to swim in that temperature water, what you find is that those people who have a big respiratory response when they first go in, so this slide is showing you the size of the respiratory response compared to swimming in warm water, then you find they're the people who stop very quickly. They find it impossible to coordinate that respiratory drive with a swim stroke. And so that's a problem related to cold, cold shock. The ones that do better are the ones that don't have that cold shock response. And you should know, if you're going to go into cold water, that you can habituate that response in as few as six immersions in cold water. I can tell you more about that over a cup of coffee. We can even have a go. Um, you may be aware that 80% of those people who die do 
uh, in a triathlon do during the swimming phase. And there are various theories um, put forward for that. It seems from the evidence that it's mostly sudden cardiac death. And about across sport, roughly 40 to 50% of those that die from sudden cardiac death, it's difficult at post-mortem to find a reason. We've suggested recently that one of the reasons for that is the co-activation of the cold shock response, trying to up your heart rate, with face immersion, which tries to slow down your heart rate. And that produces a conflict, which we call autonomic conflict, which can result in um, fairly nasty arrhythmias and perhaps explain some of those sudden cardiac deaths. The reason we don't see them in training is because when you train, you don't normally do this this mass start, where people go to breathe, they can't, they extend their breath hold, or they get water into the nose. Very powerful stimulus to the heart. So this autonomic conflict is typical in these kind of situations. Anybody know where that is? Fre any Frenchman in the audience? It's Nice. Yeah. Um, uh, it's like diving into a washing machine, those of you who have done it. Now, <clears throat> So the other thing you should know if you're training athletes is the ability to enter, do this kind of entrance, is a skill in itself. We've measured um, the skill of going into rough or surf water, and it's about an 18% difference between those who are trained to go into surf and to rough water and those who aren't over the first 200 meters of a swim. So it's worth thinking about that. If you read that paper, and you're involved in the organization of triathlons, it'll also tell you how to organize a triathlon to minimize the chance of sudden cardiac death. We can talk more about that over coffee. We're going to have a long coffee. Um, so after the skin has cooled, the next tissues to cool are the superficial nerves and muscles, and that produces physical incapacitation. Below a temperature of around about 20 degrees Celsius, the rate of conduction and the amplitude of action potentials is slowed, maximum grip strength falls, and below a muscle temperature of 27 degrees Celsius, you become physically incapacitated. Let's have a, let's have a look at how long that takes. Well, in water at 12 degrees Celsius, you reach that magic figure of 27 degrees Celsius in about 20 minutes. Um, warmer water, it takes a bit longer. What about the consequence of it? So here we see somebody who's been in 12 degree water for 20 minutes and he's being asked just to open the plastic bag that a, a, a flare is in the middle of. He's just got to open the plastic bag. He can do this in 10 seconds when he's normal, warm, warmed up and ready to exercise. He's highly motivated because when he opens this plastic bag, he can get out of the water. Now, the, what's happened is the superficial muscles, in the, particularly the arms, the forearms, have cooled. You've got lots of superficial muscles and lots of superficially running nerves, and they are what controls your manual dexterity, your ability to grip. And they're very susceptible to cooling because they're in the arms, a long cylinder, which is easy to cool. Um, so this guy who is actually a, a, a Royal Marine in, in the GB forces, can't break his way into a plastic bag after 20 minutes in water at about 12 degrees Celsius. He starts to try to use his teeth. Um, there are life rafts um, after emergency evacuations that where, where teeth were found in the life raft for exactly the same reason. The, what's the relevance to triathlon? Well, the relevance to triathlon is I wouldn't like to see him on a bicycle. Um, if you look at swimming, and what you see with people cooling is a very classic um, movement towards swim failure. So people start nice and horizontal, and then as, they, as those muscles start to cool, this incidentally is a near international standard Swedish breaststroker. Uh, and as he starts to cool, his body becomes more upright and he loses coordination. So his efficiency falls, so his sinking force goes up. And classically, you see this picture 
of somebody progressing from nice horizontal, more upright, then very upright, and then three submersions and disappear. And at the same time, as they cool, the um, stroke rate goes up and the stroke length falls. And this, for me, should be something which every person in charge of a, tri um, a triathlon, the, they should know these signs and symptoms, because this is imminent swim failure. It's shortly after this, the person will disappear below the surface of the water. Let's have a look at something else. We're 20 minutes from a coffee. Okay, we might see this. Yes, there we go. So this is a guy, very competent swimmer, in water at 25 degrees Celsius, trying to swim for just a few minutes, about 10 minutes in water at 10 degrees Celsius. And I just want you to note the expression of exhaustion on his face. He's exhausted. Why is he exhausted? He's only swum for 10 minutes. He can swim forever in warm water. Well, the reason he's exhausted is because, of course, as muscle cools, blood flow to the muscle reduces, and therefore the muscle has to switch to anaerobic metabolism sooner. So you become tired sooner. You use more glycogen. Um, your substrates deplete quicker. So that's a consequence. This shift, this shift in the um, an lactic acid threshold is absolutely dependent and caused by the reduction in muscle blood flow. Is there anything you can do as coaches um, or as triathletes? Well, we know from the studies that we and others have done that actually tricep, tricep um, protection, thickness of fat over the tricep, correlates very significantly with your ability to swim in cool water. So if you can prepare, uh, protect the upper arm and around the tricep area, you should be able to improve people's duration and capability in cold water. Okay, let's quickly look at the long-term responses. And I just show you some um, graphs, which is, these are the temperature profiles of people swimming for 90 minutes in water at different temperatures. So this is 90 minutes at 25 degrees Celsius. This is deep body temperature, and this is the change. You see that variability. If we lower the water temperature to um, 18 degrees Celsius, we see some people able to happily get warmer and thermoregulate, and other people being taken out of the water after about 25 minutes. Um, if you now lower the water temperature to 10 degrees Celsius, they all start to cool, but that one plateaus, and these guys are in trouble very quickly. And this end of the spectrum is your typical elite athlete. Thin, not much fat, highly muscled, um, and exercising hard. And that variability is therefore caused by a whole host of variables which are listed on the board. I won't go through them. Physique being a major one. Um, the, the amount of muscle mass you have and the amount of subcutaneous fat you have. That's the background. So then, as you've heard, um, the uh, ITU, FINA and IOC came along and asked us the question about their low water temperature limit. Now, I know that it's, pr it's a physical impossibility for somebody to become hypothermic as an adult human in less than 30 minutes. So if you want to go and do a 20 minute swim in zero degree water, go do it. The problem won't be your deep body temperature falling. The problem will be the cold shock response. The problem will be superficial muscle cooling, making you unable to ride a bike subsequently. And so we had to look at more than just temperature. We had to look at other functions associated with a triathlon in order to answer this question. I just want to make a note of my hard-working co-authors, Jane Hall, who's sitting at the back and did all the work. There she is there, frightening a subject. Um, Heather Massey, Mitch Lomax, and myself. The regulations at the time for racing were minimum with a wetsuit, 13 degrees Celsius water temperature. At 14 degrees Celsius, wetsuits are optional. So actually, we did three studies. Uh, they're listed here. The laboratory study of triathlon is the one I'm going to tell you about today. It was a 20-minute swim. We simulated a transition. We thought that was really important to see how good people's bike control was and then to go on and cycle a 40K time trial at race pace. Um, so this is just the details. Just to let you know, 20-minute swim in a tri-suit, um, air temperature 12 degrees, wind velocity 15 kilometers per hour, which is the maximum you need to maximize convective cooling. It was an indoor then bike handling course, which was as you see there, basically keeping the bike within a 20 meter narrow corridor as you did turns, running it out, 
cycling it back. Race pace, 40 kilometer cycle. Then we measured a whole host of stuff and we, measured, we used some of the results we got to put into a cold exposure survival model to look at the impact of air temperature um, on the responses that we saw. So we knew what to say if, it was, if a triathlon was being run in 5, 10, 15 or 20 degrees Celsius. That's what people did. There's the flume again. There's somebody getting some metabolic assessment. So in water temperature at 10, 12, they wore a wetsuit and 14. Uh, no wetsuit in 14 and 16. The participants, 12 of them, two female, were um, aged between 15 and 61. They were uh, high quality triathletes and they were typical of elite triathletes. They were fairly lean with a a uh, body fat percentage of 3 to 12% for the males and 15 to 16% for the females. Okay, what did we find? So they've done the swim, they've come out of the swim. They, the first two minutes of the swim, they sat still just to get the cold shock response. Then they swam, then they came out, then they did the transition, then they went onto the bike. Typical triathlon um, procedure. So only the 10 degrees Celsius wetsuit and the 12-14 tri-suit conditions cause participant significant difficulties. Um, in the 10 degrees Celsius with a wetsuit, three of the participants were unable to complete the swim due to headaches and the cold shock response. Those who did complete it were the more experienced cold exposed individuals. In the 14 degrees um, swim with a tri-suit, two athletes were withdrawn from the swim. Four of the eight remaining athletes had a problem either because they couldn't complete the bike skills component. They were shivering uncontrollably. They were unable to grip the handlebars. One other athlete didn't recover his deep body temperature all the way through the cycle. So let's look at some of the data. There's the cold shock response occurring in everyone, irrespective of whether they wore a wetsuit or not. So here they are before they go into the water. There they go into the water. You're seeing about a 20 or 30 beat per minute increase in heart rate. You're also seeing a decrease in respiratory control, an increase in blood pressure. Um, now here's some of the deep body temperature measurements. So this is, here, uh, this is looking at what happens to the core temperature of the body. Uh, this is the profile of those that manage to do a 10 degree C um, immersion in a wetsuit. So remember that this, the swim stops at 20 minutes and then this is the bike. So swim for 20 minutes, a couple of minutes transition where we have to unplug them because we can't run after them with the equipment, and then, then there's a cycle. 10 degree wetsuit, 12 degree wetsuit, 14 degree wetsuit. And you'll note that some of these individuals, even with just a 20 minute swim, are cooling by their deep body temperature by about one and a half degrees Celsius. Now, if we look this time um, in a tri-suit, so normal um, kind of tri-suit conditions, here we've got 14 degrees Celsius, still seeing a, a fall here, somebody down to about 35 after just 20 minutes swim. This is very different from what we see from average individuals. This is an elite response. People cool quickly when they're at that level, when they're exercising that hard with that lack of insulation that comes from subcutaneous fat. Subcutaneous fat has about the same insulation as cork. And there's the data for 16 degrees. So there's the cooling. And you'll see how long it's taking some people to get back to start in terms of how long they've exercised for before their deep body temperature returns to normal. We can just take a moment so you know the, different, you know the comparison between wetsuit um, and the, the benefits of using a wetsuit, but it was kind of emphasized in this study. So here we had seven people who did a 14 degree um, tri-suit and a 14 degree wetsuit swim. And you see the difference. You see the difference in how much they cool during the swim and how long it takes them to get back up to a normal deep body temperature. Um, they cool less and they get back to normal faster when they wore a wetsuit. So, um, on average, the linear rate of fall of deep body temperature here is three times faster in a wetsuit, uh, sorry, in a tri suit than it is in a wetsuit. And most athletes swum faster with a wetsuit regardless of deep body temperature. So, in 14 degrees Celsius, the mean distance covered was about what, 1,633 meters in a wetsuit compared to 1,493 meters um, in a tri suit. So, that just confirms wetsuits are good. What about the psychomotor skills? What about the transition? There was no significant difference in the time or error rate while running on a bike 
around the handling course, but there was in terms of cycling. So the time taken for individuals to cycle the course during the transition period compared with before it um, was significantly slower with a tri suit. And the error rate, or that's the percentage of time spent outside those narrow markings, um, with or without a foot down or a hand on the wall, was significantly worse in the 12 degree Celsius wetsuit swim and the 14 degree tri suit swim compared to the control um, pre exposure. The athletes were not able to tell us how cold they were. They had no perception of their deep body temperature. Very poor correlation between thermal comfort perception and thermal sensitivity and how much they're... So you can't rely on individuals to say, I'm cold, I must stop. Um, so what about air temperature? Well, this is where we did the modelling, and I just put this up to say we modelled a 20-minute, 14-degree swim in air temperatures ranging between 5 and 15 degrees Celsius. The data that went into the model came from the stuff we collected during the experiment, and we modeled a 25-year-old male, 70 kilogram body mass, 8% body fat. The model is a cold exposure survival model. It's run by most of the countries in the world to estimate survival time in cold water. The author of it, um, Dr. Peter Tequesis, amended the um, model in order to meet our requirements. And we used a reasonable cycling efficiency and heat production um, in terms of the heat being produced during the cycle phase. And we found that the 5 and 15 degrees Celsius um, conditions made little difference. The athletes were still able to rewarm um, over the period of a cycle. So air temperature is, as you probably would expect, is much less significant than water temperature in terms of the impact on body temperature. Um, so there was one scenario where rectal temperature didn't do as well, and that was when people were regarded as completely naked and not producing very much heat. So we can conclude in terms of air temperature that elite triathlon, air temperature between 5 and 15 degrees C, heat produced by the triathletes, should result in a positive thermal balance and people regaining their deep body temperature. Although we think it's probably wise to have a cutoff from what you see in the real world of around about 10 degrees Celsius air temperature. So, in summary, let's go through what we found. In a tri suit versus a wetsuit, the rate of cooling is three times faster in a tri suit. Um, swimming performance is worse, transition is slower, and greater handling errors occur on the bike. The recovery of deep body temperature takes longer. We don't think it's safe to conduct elite triathlons in water temperatures of 10 degrees Celsius um, because of cold shock and the possibility of autonomic conflict, although you should be able to reduce both of those problems. In 14 degrees C in a tri suit, um, the impact on bike handling, inability to, uh, of the athletes to grip the handlebars, and there was slow rewarming. So that causes some problems. 12 degree wetsuit swims and above were completely successful, uh, and they maintained a safe level of bike handling skills. All athletes who participated in the a 16 degree water temperature tri suit swim completed the condition. Now we know from the other measures we've taken that we could work out an algorithm to say if you're this fat, if you've got this amount of body mass, if you've got this surface area, that's the cutoff for you in terms of doing a triathlon. But there's no event organizer in the world who's going to apply that algorithm when people apply to do a triathlon. So we can do it, but it's not going to happen. Um, so, if you're running a triathlon in water below 20 degrees Celsius, it would be worth giving the athletes the opportunity to pre-expose themselves to the conditions because that reduces the cold shock response. You could also cold habituate them. If they're going to go into a cool water triathlon at the beginning of the season, as little as six two or three minute immersions in cold water will halve the cold shock response. And that reduction lasts at least 14 months. Um, we need to be considering, even more than hypothermia, the impact of cold shock and peripheral neuromuscular cooling on performance. Those providing um, safety cover should be aware of the signs of swimming failure and the possibility of a rapid deterioration in swim performance. 
Athletes should not be relied on to accurately determine when they should stop. So what about water temperatures? Olympic distance elite triathlon events considering safety on the bike post-immersion compulsory wetsuit use in water temperature below 16 degrees Celsius is recommended. Above 16 degrees Celsius, tri-suit swims are realistic for nearly all triathletes, but wetsuits should be recommended below 20 degrees Celsius. Even with wetsuits, swim events are not recommended due to cold shock in water below 12 degrees Celsius. Each athlete should be able to produce enough heat to rewarm um, body temperature during cycling, even in air temperatures of 5 degrees Celsius, although it would be prudent to keep that temperature above 10 degrees Celsius, if possible. That was a tour of cold water immersion and its effect on performance. I'd like to acknowledge the people listed on this slide for their input in all aspects of the study. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. As after this uh, presentation, I, I think that we will change some of our rule for the next year. We are working for the sport department to adapt our rule, our actual rule, to the next uh, year to put, uh, I think, as a lower temperature 12, uh, to put mandatory the use of that suite uh, when the uh, water temperature is below 16. There are some questions for Mike? Thanks for the presentation, Mike. Is there anything being done on uh, clothing in uh, lower air temperature out of the swim? Yeah, I think one of the things that comes out of this would be um, a recommendation for uh, when, you know, when air temperature is getting down to below 15, 10 degrees Celsius, that more clothing should definitely be worn on the bike section, or at least initially. Because when you do the modeling, if you have somebody dry, you can you know, happily go out and exercise in 10 or 15 degrees. I mean, in fact, it's ideal between 10 and 15 for endurance activity. However, when people come out of the water already pre-cooled, superficially, and surface wetted, then actually 10 degrees represents and below represents a significant, uh, a significant thermal challenge, early on at least. So certainly, if you want to maintain functionality and performance during the early phase, um, you would have more clothing, uh, particularly on the upper body, particularly on the arms, and you'd probably try and find a way of getting rid of that once people had rewarmed. I mean, one of the slides I showed showed a very cold hand of a cyclist way into the cycle. And actually, one of the ways to get some idea of where your deep body temperature is, is your peripheral vasculature in your fingers will not open up until your deep body temperature is above, slightly above normal. So if people just keep an eye on their hands, um, one of the ways they do it for example, in the military, as you do that, you put your fingertips on your lips. If they feel warm, you're vasodilated. If they feel cold, you're still vasoconstricted. So, yeah, that's a long answer, and the answer is yes. Yes, also, also the experience of the field say that when the air temperature is below 10 degrees, we have some problem also in the elite athletes. Uh, and in some cases, when they ride slowly, we have a lot of uh, cases of hypothermia. I think that uh, we need... Uh, uh, to thinking about to put uh, another rule about the mandatory use of the jacket or some to cover the arm when the air temperature is uh, below 10 degrees. At the upper end of water, just to send you into coffee with something to smile about, once the water temperature gets above 25 degrees Celsius, then the primary problem changes from temperature to shark. You swim a lot faster then. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question for you, Mike. Uh, you spoke about the cold uh, shock and the necessity that uh, a federation takes some rule to prevent, uh, to design uh, uh, a percus or a situation to adapt uh, uh, the athletes to the water temperature. What do you think about that? What you can suggest to us? Um, yeah, so uh, there's various ways you can do it. You can uh, give people the opportunity to pre-immerse so that they actually lower their skin temperature a bit. Now, you don't want to do this too early, 
Because if you do it too early, you start a cooling process where they're now standing around waiting to start. But ha having the ability just to cool the skin down before you start means that the temperature change when you do start is reduced because you've pre-cooled the skin. Now, you can do that pre-starting in a controlled way. Whereas during a start, a mass start, where people are running down a beach or just pushing their way in, that, that's much more problematic. So certainly, we've, as we've said, that in water temperatures below about 20 degrees Celsius, it would be worth giving people the opportunity of pre-adapting to the water temperature before they engage in a mass start, where they'll then lose control of their respiration at a time when they really need it. In terms of the long-term adaptation or habituation, then that can be achieved by um, just repeated cold water immersions. We all know open water, cold water swimmers who have no cold shock response whatsoever. And the reason they don't have a cold shock response is because they've habituated it. And it takes as few, as I say, five or six three-minute immersions in cold water, you can halve that cold shock response. And more importantly, in halving the response, you get your respiration back under control. So when you go to breathe and you don't have the opportunity because there's a wave in your face or somebody is splashing you, you can hold your breath and extend it. Thank you very much, Mike, for the excellent presentation.